Directions to Princeton Hospital. Getting directions to Princeton Animal Hospital. Directions to Princeton Hospital. Getting directions to Princeton Animal Hospital. Princeton Hospital. Here's Princeton Animal Hospital. It's about two and a half miles south. Can you ask some more time? Like Hospitals near Princeton. Searching for you past open in. Where are you saying love? Just, uh, one has to be careful. If you say too little, they can't help you. And if you say too much, they think you're a kind of mental patient. From as early as I can remember, I wanted to swallow the world whole. Dreaming about all the places I would go and the things I would see. I thought if I dreamed hard enough, anything was possible. A film by Jennifer Breyer. Today we talked with a US student studying abroad in Beijing. Well, I know some of us are kind of scared, actually. We are constantly telling ourselves a story about who we are and where we're going. For example, that's my husband, Omar. I met him when I was 25. We were both at Harvard getting our PhDs. Three months later, I knew I wanted to marry him. I meet Jen when she's visiting campus. And I'm like, wow, who's that? She's really cute. And- Really? Yeah. And, Aww. and, and but I've got no game, right? So the whole session, thinking like, how do I start a conversation with her? And then at the end of the session, she comes over and talks to me. And I was like, yes. And she says, <laughs> like, what is going on tonight? And I was just like, this is, this is, this is never happening. <laughs> Omar holding the back of the kayak, flailing all over the place to try to get in. Hopefully this is just a kayaking trip, not a metaphor. I mean, sure, we all know nothing lasts forever. I just thought I would have more time. And then one day I got a fever of 104.7 degrees. I got better, but something wasn't right. I would go to the kitchen to get a glass of water and then I wouldn't be able to move again. I don't know what I did to myself. I don't think I can get up off the couch. Ugh. I know you might be saying to yourself, if I really couldn't stand up, why would I be filming it? Well, I kind of um, think that someone should see this. <sighs> that first year, I had six infections. Okay, turn off the light. I would basically get out of bed, go to class, and then I was in bed again. 
I'd go to the doctor and he would tell me, you're just dehydrated. Everyone gets stressed. So I don't know if this is going to happen at the doctor's office or not, but I, um, I figure it's good to just keep documenting. My right side of my face feels numb. I feel like my brain is misfiring. Sometimes I have these strange little moments where, like, my hand will make a fist and then I can't open it. Sometimes I wouldn't be able to speak. I'd have no thoughts, no words. I would be sensitive to light, and the slightest sound could cause excruciating pain. I didn't know what else to do, so I just kept filming. chivalrous thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna turn it for a minute. It happened all of a sudden, I don't know. It's like someone turned off the lights or something. I saw every kind of specialist. Infectious disease doctors, endocrinologists, cardiologists, and finally, a neurologist. My neurologist diagnosed me with conversion disorder. He said that all of my symptoms, even the fever, the infection for which I took antibiotics, were being caused by some distant trauma I might not even be able to remember. Either that, or I was just really stressed out about my final exams. For the next several years, I spent most of my time bedridden. I thought maybe I had a rare disease. Maybe I was dying. And then I went online and found thousands of other people all over the world, just like me. Yeah, I'm completely bedridden. I've lost the ability to walk. I crawl from my bed to my bathroom and I just think, this is my life. What a shithole. It's the cognitive problems that are the most disabling. I live in a dark room 24-7. I have ME, CFS, that's chronic fatigue syndrome, or myalgic encephalomyelitis, I think is the term that you're supposed to use now. I've had some kind of ME-CFS for about eight years now. I was 10 years old when I first got sick. I was a really competitive skier. At one point I was ranked 17th on the entire East Coast for mogul skiing. This is the couch. These three cushions where I spend my life. And out there, that's that's all my old life. The chronic fatigue syndrome. It's been called the yuppie flu, Epstein-Barr, and a living hell by those who suffer from it. There's still no adequate medical explanation for it. 
The experts say it could be triggered by viruses. We all get tired, but is it chronic fatigue syndrome? Some believe that's a made-up condition. You have chronic fatigue, ME. You're in that percentage of people who are severely disabled. Based on your duration of illness, uh, you are still in that category that we call in the sort of the acute phase. And the CDC statistics that if you've been sick five years, you're unlikely to recover. I agree with that statistic. People reach a plateau of function that's better than they were at baseline, but not that they have a full recovery. You receive mostly symptomatic therapy. I had no idea if it would be months or years or decades. It was like I had died, but was forced to watch as the world moved on. If I completely disappear and I'm in this bed and I can do nothing, then it's like I don't even exist or that I never existed. And then what was the point of it all, of being born in the first place? You know, and honestly, there are a lot of days when I just feel like I'm doing a good job by just holding it together and not killing myself. Like, I'm really proud of that. And it's not, I really don't want to die. Like, I really don't want to die. But at a certain point, it's hard to call this living and I think the grief of all those things I might not do or see or have or ah. Yeah, so it's sad. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Welcome to my world of one room. Um, I have been severely unwell for eight years. I found Jessica online. She was so young and had lost so much, yet somehow she found a way to keep going. So I asked if I could film her. Um, even if we have to do it 10 minutes at a time over like many days, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Jessica, happy birthday to you. Can you get one? 
Come on, come on. Excellent. I get to my birthday and for me that's a really difficult date because I think it's another year in bed. I need your help check on this. I remember my 16th birthday in bed and remember my 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st. I made it into a chair for a couple of seconds for my 22nd, but other than that, I was in bed. You need your injection, don't you? Injection mint champagne. Mint champagne. Well, and that, for me, is in a very, very scary because you don't realise when you're in a bubble quite how much time goes, you know? The everyday joy. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yes. Have some champagne. When I was 14, I suffered with a flu-like virus. I was sleeping all through school. And I had the teachers shouting at me, saying, Jessica, pull your head off that table. I remained in hospital for four years constantly. I was in a semi-coma. The doctors had no idea what to do. The nurses were getting frustrated at me for not getting better. They almost saw me as a lost cause. Very lucky to have a sister like you. Can't do makeup. Open. That'll do. Thank you. <laughs> when you were in that hospital and you couldn't move or speak, how did you stay sane? I stayed sane because I can do uh, lots of things with my mind and I go to many different places all over the world in my mind. I love Australia because I love the water and I'd love to go scuba diving there. As I jump into the water and have that freedom of my body moving but there being no sound and multitude of different colours of fish calm you down and relax you. It becomes more and more magical and still there's that silence. I suffer with severe osteoporosis because I've been bedridden for so long with ME. So I have the bones of a hundred year old. I'm quite a tall girl. I've actually grown four inches in the time I've been bedridden. Um, so I've never actually stood up at this height. About two a month ago, I touched the floor for the first time. 
Feet do all right. Feet on the ground. <laughs> Feet on the ground. <laughs> What's that? That's mental. Oh my goodness. When did you last do this? <sighs> Not for about. Oh, probably for eight years. Eight years? But you sat on the bed with Tom, didn't you? On the yeah, edge. but I didn't go like this. Push down on your feet. <laughs> Sleepy? Your video is starting. There you are. I started filming more and more people all over the world from my bed. Camera Steve. Who am I going to be looking at? Oh, you're looking at the, this camera right there. Okay. You feel me near sport, but I found out that my disease isn't rare at all. A million people in the US have it. 17 million around the world. So that means it's twice as common as multiple sclerosis. Like MS, it's a spectrum disorder. I know people who can work, and you'd never know from looking at them that they were sick, or who can walk but have cognitive problems a quarter of us are homebound or bedridden, and yet we have to live with this stigma. I saw someone collecting the other day for ME. That's the one where I don't feel like going to work today. <laughs> Chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, I'm tired too. <laughs> Jen? Nancy, one, take one, part. I'm Nancy Klimas. I'm a clinical immunologist, which is the study of the immune systems. Clinical immunology is a kind of a very small specialty. There aren't very many people around that do clinical immunology. I was one of a kind. I was the only immunologist at my university. The year was 84. That was the year the HIV hit the scene big time. My practice was people Without HIV were people who didn't make antibody, people that were getting sick without explanation. A patient came in to see me and she had been brutalized by the healthcare system. She was terribly ill, she was profoundly fatigued. She'd been put on antidepressants without any depression. She'd been put on antipsychotics without any mental, mental illness whatsoever. It was shocking. So I was listening to her, she was just telling me this story. She says, if you would just at least look at my immune system and see if there's something wrong. We had this amazing laboratory that could look at all kinds of parts of the immune system. So I put her through the whole nine yards, everything we knew how to do at the time. And I came back to her about four weeks later, and, and I said, I'm sorry to say that there's something terribly wrong with your immune system. And your cells that are antiviral just don't do much. In culture, they can't kill the virally infected targets. You're making all kinds of inflammatory cytokines. This is a sick immune system. Well, she burst into tears, and I thought, oh my god, you know, poor thing. Oh my, I'm such an idiot. I mean, I must have said this wrong. I should have broken it to her. And she was crying with joy. It was joyful tears, because she had been told by everyone there was absolutely nothing wrong with her. It had to be in her head. And I was telling her there was something terribly wrong with her, and she was thrilled, happy, joyful, because she had, it wasn't in her head. 
So then this word of mouth thing happened. And I had about 25 patients that I did this same workup and there was a consistent look. So we published a paper that said that there was a natural killer cell deficiency. These cells that are antiviral couldn't kill viruses. This illness appeared to be a form of an acquired immune deficiency. Now, if you go back historically, you can see illnesses very similar to this called many different things. Over the last century, there have been roughly 70 outbreaks of a strikingly similar disease. In each case, often following an outbreak of a virus like Epstein-Barr or Coxsackie, a small percentage of people never seem to get better. For a long time, it was seen as a new form of polio. And later, encephalomyelitis, which means inflammation of the brain and spinal cord until an outbreak in the 1980s, when it was given a new name. A mystery disease has struck the town of Incline Village, Nevada, a disease for which doctors have no cure. Doctors have diagnosed more than 200 cases of the same illness in this area. In all of my years of training and practice, I've never seen anything quite like this. She's talking out of the lens. Yes. OK, all right. Do you remember the beginning of the outbreak? of what would later come to be called chronic fatigue syndrome? I can recall to this day uh, those moments. One was an epidemic of apparent mono in a girls basketball team. And by July, August, we had over 200 cases of adult viral-like syndrome. It wasn't the fact they were showing up sick. It was the fact that they remained sick as the years went by they not only remain sick, their sickness actually evolved into something different than it was at the beginning. Fatigue. Now they were complaining of severe and debilitating fatigue. They began to complain of, of strange cognitive complaints. We were certain we were looking at something that we had never, ever heard of before and began thinking about asking for help. When the CDC came out to investigate, they looked at patients' charts. They noted that all of their lab results were normal. And then they went skiing. Dr. William Reeves, the man in charge of investigating chronic fatigue for the CDC, told us over the phone that one, there is no viral cause for this problem. Two, there are no immune system abnormalities in patients with chronic fatigue. And three, there are no clusters. So when asked about the illness at Lake Tahoe, he said that was hysteria. I was two during the Incline Village outbreak. 30 years later, we don't seem any closer. We know ME can be triggered by viruses and bacterial infections but we don't know if the infection hides in places where it's hard to measure, like the brain, or if it's long gone, but leaves in its wake an autoimmune disease. There are now a handful of specialists, but most patients will never get to see one. I was lucky. My doctor prescribed me an antiviral drug called Valcite. Two days later, I was walking again. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hello. She sees you now. Hello. She sees you. Are you all right? I'm good. I'm doing awesome. <laughs>
Where's the soap? Oh, God. Ah! Let's get you some I magnesium. Get, stop! I, I can't. I could feel everything in my head swelling, pushing out my eyeballs. I would try to speak, and the sounds that would come out of my mouth would be gibberish. I can't understand, love. improved from two hours ago. And, you know, it's, it's still, I still feel very lucky. <laughs> Thank you. And fatherhood? <laughs> I can't imagine any, any other way. Yeah. Yeah. There are moments where I see us through other people's eyes and somehow that's much sadder than when I'm just kind of living our life together. This is normal for us. Like it's, you, it's so normal. And it's only when other people observe how not normal it is that I'm, I'm forced to recalibrate and sit with You know what it is about being observed? It's that people feel sorry for me. And I don't know why that... Maybe I'm so sorry. It's a nerve. the guy that first introduced me to email 10 years ago. Technology is not something that is oppositional to black people. Technology is opportunity. When I met Omar, I thought, here's a guy who's going to change the world. I think I've got one, the 40-year-old intern. Now I feel like if he's with me, he can't become the person that he was meant to be. I think there's definitely a sense on the internet that he is the first member of the internet kind of generation to own, to, to become a president. What's impossible to capture is just how hard this is day in, day out. It's hard to like go on Facebook and see friends like, having kids, raising kids. I just feel like our lives are frozen in this kind of sickness amber. I 
can't be anybody's mom like this. I can't be anybody's wife like this. I don't feel like I'm a person. I haven't showered in forever in my hair. And I, I, I just, I have nothing. I can't give you anything. You're my wife. I can't give you anything. And you bring joy so into my sorry. life every day. Jen. Is it super bright in there? Or? How is the light for you? I usually keep it really dark in here, but it's okay. Before I got sick, we just lived, you know, husband and wife. <laughs> the wife had dinner ready when the husband came home and the house clean. And when you first got sick, what did your husband think of all of this as it was as, as it was happening? I saw 10 to 12 doctors that told me there was nothing wrong with me. I think that's maybe when Randy started doubting a little bit about how sick I was. Yes. Oh, you got. And all of my husband's family, they were just immediately jumped on that. Oh, it's something mental. The doctors can't find something. It must just be in her head. We were married for 14 years, and I kind of feel like that's about as much as he could take. <laughs> It was really scary when he left. I was worried about how I was gonna cope with everything, how I was gonna do everything. I had some struggles with my faith. I just felt so alone. I honestly don't have any friends now. They're gone. The only people that never questioned me were my children. Hi! <laughs> Somebody see you, babe. Hey, Jeff, hey, Jeff, hey, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. I remember Jessica, before she had gone to school, she would clean the house and vacuum and do all this stuff for me. So they just kind of took over when he left. They just jumped in there for me. I missed graduations. I missed ball games. I miss things that mothers don't miss. But... I was with my girls more than anybody I know was with their kids. Did you see my Batmans? Yeah. Well, Aren't you proud good. of me? Yeah, I'm real proud of you. You know, they would come in my room and sit and we'd talk for hours. That's the most important thing about being a mom is when your kids need you, you're there for them. I thought the worst day of my life was when I got diagnosed, but it wasn't. Casey. It was when Casey got diagnosed. That was the worst day of my life. I was in denial at first. I didn't want to think that was even a possibility for me to get what she had. 
probably a good six to seven months after I had been very, very ill, I found a neurologist and he said, well, I have good news and bad news. And the good news is I figured out what you have and it's chronic fatigue syndrome. The bad news is there's nothing we can do and you're going to have to go home and wait it out. Wait for a cure. The bubbles swimming in, in the, the bubbles. bubbles. Very good. Bobbing. Bobbing. Very Bobbing. good. Annabelle's asked me before, yeah. why are you and Grandma both sick? And what does that mean? Am I going to get sick? I don't think she's scared necessarily, but she's definitely asked questions and I don't really have answers. Who wants onions? I'm kind of hungry still. I ate one hamburger. My dad did not believe my mom was sick. He says up until I got sick, but when I got sick, it just, I guess, jolted him into believing, wait a second, this, this is real. I don't say anything. Grandma says hi, Annabelle. I think Casey deals with this disease like she does because she saw how I dealt with it. And it didn't stop me from being a mom. Can you see my arms are getting tired? Can you still see it? Having kids with this would be the hardest thing you'd ever do. And it would be the best thing that you'd ever do. You'd be a great mom. You'd be a great mom. You're like an hour old. I was starting to see that maybe we didn't have to let go of everything we'd hoped for. But I still had so many basic questions. If we had kids, would it be safe? Could my son or daughter get what I have? And I didn't know why so many doctors couldn't answer these basic questions. Mm -hmm. Doctors want to know what to do, but it's not in the textbooks of medicine. What, what, what are we supposed to do? You know, so they have to go the same place you go and Google it. In the United States, we're still graduating class after class of medical students that haven't even heard of this illness and where to even look for its diagnostic criteria. The name, this chronic fatigue syndrome name, has been part of it. And let me be a feminist for a moment. Being a woman is part of it. 85% of the people with this illness are, are female. Hysteria. It's an idea as old as written history. The Egyptians thought it was caused by a wandering womb. The Greeks blamed sexual deprivation. Sigmund Freud repressed memories. Some lessons of childhood can become the source of illness which has no discoverable basis in physical condition. Today, what we'd like to do is to demonstrate uh, the mechanism known as convergent reaction. Uh, our patient is a young woman. She had some rather Puzzling symptoms. We now call hysteria functional disorder or conversion disorder, which is what I was originally diagnosed with. I hear from women all of the time who were later diagnosed with fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, lupus, who were initially told they were hypochondriacs. 80% of autoimmune disease patients are women. I can't help but wonder if that's why we're disbelieved. Feelings of more than usual tiredness, nervousness, and discomfort. It suggests emotional difficulties which the patient herself does not understand. The problem with psychosomatic diagnoses is that they can never be proven. They are names we give to illnesses when we can't find the biological cause but that doesn't mean there isn't one. 
The patient, as you can see, is a rather dependent girl, a girl who, under many circumstances, cannot admit to angry feelings. This is the story we tell until doctors can see our disease from the outside. MS was called hysterical paralysis, right up to the day they invented a CAT scan machine. Because now we had the capacity to look at the brain and see those great big white spots of demyelination. So it went from hysterical to real. We used to institutionalize women with hysteria. It's always tempting to look at the past as something strange and distant, to say, thank God we know better now. But what I could never have imagined had I not gotten this disease is that we're still doing this. Det skete jo det den 12. februar sidste år. Og ligesom jeg afventede bare, at Karina var klar til, at hun skulle have morgenmad, så bankede det på døren. Og jeg kunne bare høre på den måde, de bankede på, at det ikke bare var en ven eller en nabo, der kom på besøg. Fordi det var sådan meget øh, hårdt og insisterende banken. Og jeg lukker op, og udenfor i forteltet, der står der, Fem betjente. Jeg giver bare et chok, fordi man kunne jo se, hvad det, hvad det var, der skulle ske. Jeg sagde, I kan da ikke bare bræse ind til en dødssyg ME-patient. Og de sagde jo, enten lukkede jeg op for den, eller også øh, ville de springe døren. Jeg er jo på arbejde. Men så ringer han telefonen, og jeg kunne se, at det var Karina. Og jeg tager den jo så, og så siger hun, far, hjælp ind på værelset. Og så kører jeg, jeg springer og søger i bilen, og så siger jeg til jer, at jeg kører hjem, der er nok alt hjemme der. Og så da jeg kommer kørende herop, så kan jeg godt se, at der er de der fire betjente der. De var jo, kunne jeg så se, de var jo både bevæbnet og alting. Så kørte de med Karina uden vi var op og sige farvel eller noget, så man ville ikke engang se hende eller noget. Det lå en sal, at, at hun var fjernet, og vi ville høre nærmere. Og vi fik ikke engang at vide, hvor de kørte hen. Det er et år siden, jeg har set min datter. In Denmark, the health authorities do not recognize ME as a uh, physical disease. They said it is a psychiatric disease. Sygdomme som fibromyalgi, tinnitus, kronisk træthedssyndrom, parfumeallergi og en hel række andre er siden 1999 puttet i en fælles hat, der hedder funktionelle lidelser. Og for... Vores praktiserende læge dengang, han foreslog, at vi skulle øh, få Karina sendt til øh, psykiater. Eller nej, det sagde, han nævnte ikke psykiater, men det var til forskningsklinikken for funktionelle lidelser i Aarhus ved Per Fink. Og for 15 år siden, der blev du sat i den her stol og skulle finde ud af, hvad funktionelle lidelser det var. Har du fundet ud af, om det er en fysisk sygdom eller en psykisk sygdom? Nej, det har jeg absolut ikke. Og det er også et spørgsmål, det er for mig er det næsten umuligt at besvare. Helt i gamle dage kaldte man det hysteri og hypokondri. I dag kan vi se, at det er ikke er sådan noget indbildt. 
Men de metoder, man anvender i psykiatrien, og den anskuelse, man har i psykiatrien, er, er dem, der bedst kunne forklare det her fænomen. Den anden del af det, det er også, at meget siger, det var langt det mest fascinerende at arbejde med psyk. Og er der ikke også nogen, der bliver øh, vrede over for at vide, at de fejler noget, der tangerer noget psykisk, når de nu har fysiske altså, symptomer? Altså, når, når, når vi først øh, får snakket med folk om, hvad det er for noget, det, det, det er som regel på grund af fordomme eller andre ting, at man, man tænker på den måde. Når vi først får forklaret, hvad det er for noget, er det ekstremt sjældent, at vi får nogen, der, der, der er vrede over det. Det kan selvfølgelig forekomme, men, men det er altså meget sjældent øh, nu om det, at vi, vi har de problemer. Undskyld mig, har du tænkt dig at lukke Karina ud snart, eller har du tænkt dig at ignorere folk, eller? Vi er fri, Karina! Vi er fri, Karina! Karina is only been seen by the psychiatric doctors that took her away from her parents. She's not been allowed to be seen by any other doctors. That's where the fight really started. When I first heard of the story, I could hardly believe it. But I learned that in many countries, doctors have been removing severe patients from their homes for decades. This is their general idea. Your symptoms are being caused by false beliefs you have about your illness. Your parents indulge these beliefs, and this has kept you sick. So removing you from their influence is the only way you can get better. Do you know what you were accused of? Jamen, det, det var vel, at, at hun, var, øh, hun var inde i et, 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 et mørkt rum, eller et et lysdæmpet rum, og ly, ligesom om, at, at vi øh, jamen, holdt din fange, det har jeg nu sagt. Det er uhyggeligt, ja, at man ser bare der og, og har i det ese, at du går bare derhen og sparker dør ind. Men jeg er jo klar over, hvis, hvis jeg gør det, så går det ikke længe inden, så er jeg sat fast ned i Aarhus. Præcis det, psykiater, de siger, har det var godt, vi fik en fjern der for den der. Det er næsten nødt til at sætte ord på, jo. hvordan man, man har det. Fordi Det er det værste, når det går ud over ens børn hele tiden. Det er jo sådan, og det er jo... Det er jo det, er det bedste, vi har. Undskyld. Maybe it's harder to see the harm when it's caused by good intentions. When my neurologist diagnosed me, he said my symptoms were caused by a distant trauma, one I might not even remember. So I walked home. In spite of the pain in my legs, the burning in my brain. Yes, I did. Smart in the turkey. Did you have like help? No. My body was screaming. But I ignored it because he told me this has no biological cause. As soon as I walked through the door, I collapsed. That was the last time I ever walked that far. I used to be angry. Maybe I still am. 
but I believe my doctor wanted to help. When medicine has no answers for you, where do you turn? I have the cure to mother frickin' chronic fatigue. I cured my chronic fatigue with a high carb vegan diet in three days. Started eating the good foods, the whole foods. Balance your chemistry, acid alkaline balance. Two dietary supplements, uh, they can really, really help. It's like a space alien. The lightning process changed my life. I've been tapping a lot. I take magnesium every day. Oh my god. I don't really know what's going on, but something I'm taking, it feels like it's working. Of course, I would never know what it was, because I just added five new things and... Ooh, delicious gastrointestinal support. Yes! I feel like I'm Betty Flintstone, you know, like this is some crazy prehistoric dinosaur food. Whoa! But my husband is sort of thinking a little bit about fecal transplants and um, self-administered hookworm. I think even I have certain lines that I, um, at least at this point in time, I'm not quite ready to cross. It's like the craziest high school science experiment you've ever done. <laughs> it's, sort of, it's just technical enough to feel like, wow, I'm doing something kind of novel and scientific. So the goal is to basically stun the worms and they drop out of your gut. Okay. A few months ago, I started avoiding really small amounts of toxic mold, and since then, my exercise intolerance has disappeared. I'm trying to avoid mold at all costs. Well, there, there is quite a bit of evidence of the toxicity of mold. I started hearing from more and more people who were seeing huge improvements by leaving their homes and going to drier climates. Will strategically reducing my mold exposure make me a better lover? Are you okay with this? I'm, uh, I'm okay with this. But you think it's got a little crazy. This is you letting off a little steam. <laughs> There's no way to approach this except as crazy. But just because it's crazy doesn't mean it's wrong. But there's no <laughs> doubt that it's crazy. Uh, I know. Well, I'm walking. Yeah. On the path. Yeah. Like, just because... Easy trigger. You gotta come back up that. Don't, uh, don't, don't, don't. seems really hard and it is but like just think of the gift that we live here and that there's space how is that a gift if it makes you sick it you know it doesn't just touch clothes it doesn't just touch the car it doesn't just touch the house it doesn't just touch like where we live like it potentially touches every aspect of our lives and that's scary to me if you could have the signals that i have for like an hour i feel like you would like everything would change right and conversely if you 
lived with this total absence of these signals, you would feel oh, insane every time you're making some great adjustment in your life for something that is... You can't see or touch or taste or experience. It's totally invisible. Inside. Okay, you see. Or you gets too close, honestly. I, 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 that's, no. an, that's an impossible request to not well, get well, too I, close I'm just, to it. I, I'm saying you could like, be wearing wool free clothes when you're around the tent. Why don't I take off all my clothes? <laughs> yeah, do that. So there's a hook. There's a hook here. I'm trying to be serious, love. Uh, and, and I'm trying to be serious. There's no way for me to not touch the tent and assemble the you, tent. You, you, Jay, I, I, re I, I think what I'm trying to say is I realize that that being in wool free clothes is probably better for interacting with our home. Do you, would you mind changing? Into what? Like these were mold free. You 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 sniffed these. These were mold free. Yeah, but you went inside the house. I I I, I like 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 I I didn't want you to change into mold free clothes. I wanted you to change into clothes that you can wear in the house. I cannot change clothes every time I walk in and outside the house. That is that is that is. When you're our new house or my new house at least, you have to be very careful. Otherwise, it's buy a new tent and do it all over again, which is kind of silly. Hey, what, what do you want me to do right now? I think you should, I think you should probably shower and put on your clothes. Okay, well, um, then you're on your own for now. I, I really don't make the rules. I, 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 you, you have to appreciate, it feels insane. Like, I changed my clothes an hour ago, now I'm changing them again. It's like, it's a little maddening. I'll just avoid you like I'm the plague. I used to think if I looked hard enough, I was going to find a cure. And I have found a lot of things that have helped. The antivirals, mold avoidance, even some of the supplements. But I'm not going to figure this out on my own. Inside every cell, there's your energy-making machine. It's called a mitochondria. So in this illness, each individual cell can have real problems capturing the things they need that your body uses to make energy, like oxygen and glucose. At a cellular level, you become less and less effective, like a wound down clock. If our neurons don't have enough energy, we can't think. If our immune cells don't have enough energy, we can't fight viruses. And if our muscles don't have enough energy, we can't move. Okay. But where you can really see it is when we crash after physical or mental exertion. Our cells give out and all our symptoms flare. Dr. Klimas' team can actually track this crash point on a metabolic level. There's two different kinds of energy. There's aerobic energy and there's anaerobic energy that you get from the cell itself. We teach people how to stay in that tiny little space of aerobic, and it is little. Sometimes it's two minutes, sometimes it's three minutes of effort. You can safely operate in this space without crashing. Okay. Mm -hmm. The minute that you go into the anaerobic space and you ask the cells to make energy, you're in big trouble, because you don't have it. I think this is half the reason this disease is so hard to understand why someone like me can be walking one moment and look completely normal. And then a few hours later, crash in bed for days. I feel like I'm this broken battery that's stuck at 10%. And when we crash, we disappear. So you never see us at our worst. I was amazed to find out how many questions 
we've never really asked. Why do more women get it? Is it genetic? And why, 30 years into it, are we still no closer to a cure? Hey, how are you doing? Oh, good. This is kind of amazing <laughs> type, type of interview. Yeah. You've spent your life tackling really hard problems. Why has it been so hard to figure out what's going on in patients like me? What's usually hard about a problem is that you often have to take a very different perspective than what is conventional. I look on trying to figure out CFS is one of the most difficult things I've ever tried to tackle. CFS is extremely complicated disease involving the immune system and the brain and, and who knows what else. Plasma, we perform. We're studying a very small population of severely ill patients and we're collecting billions of data points on each patient. A subset of the DNA performing whole genome sequencing. We're probably collecting more data on an individual than has ever been collected for any disease in history. And I've teamed up with the really superb scientists. Three of them have a Nobel Prize. And in two, three months, we'll have some data to, to sit at the table and look at, not publish, just, you know, some of the data to look at that would be real. Almost exclusively, the organization that funds medical research is the National Institutes of Health. Chronic fatigue syndrome is the lowest funded of any major disease by a lot. Many of the people that are at NIH and have in the past not believed it's real. So why would you fund something that's not real? I've written two applications to the National Institutes of Health. Both of them were turned down without review. We have to attempt every, every door at NIH. If we get shut out from every door, then the only recourse we have is go to Congress. What's his, uh, what's called TPN, total peripheral nutrition. So that's all he gets for food. The speech center gets affected. It's probably been a year since he's talked. He loved traveling and taking photographs. One day he asked us to take his camera out of his room. And then he motioned for me to let him hold it for a minute. And he just hugged his camera and then like told it goodbye and I took it out of the room. He was my best friend. It's hard to find somebody that knows you like your sibling does when you're close like that.
I got to try to rewrite this grant and put it in again. I just found myself getting pissed off. All these people are clamoring for funding and they're tell you no for the stupidest of reasons. I think they'll come around. It's, I just I just worry how long it's going to take them to come around. Well, Their maybe we should is, tell them that we'd like them to structure. come around before our son is dead. Yes. I'm working against the clock. How much time does he have? When they get to the point where some of his organs start shutting down or something like that, I worry about that. Sometimes I just dream that that door opens and he walks out the door. One of the highest death rate from CFS is suicide, which really, really scares me because I don't want him gone before they figure out a way to help him. I can't do it for much longer. I, I don't, I don't. It's just like, I'm just watching my life disappear. I'm watching everybody else grow up and do all the things that people do when they grow up. And I just spend all my life in, fucking, in a house, watching the world just pass. We've lost so many people. I hear stories of other children ripped from their home by police. I've lost friends to suicide. I've had friends who were doing okay and then just got worse. Sickness doesn't terrify me and death doesn't terrify me. What terrifies me is that you can disappear because someone's telling the wrong story about you. I feel like that's what's happened to all of us who are living this. And I remember thinking, there's no one coming to look for me because no one even knows that I went missing. All of those things, those things, those really Simple things. Not realizing how fragile they were because you never do. You never do. That life was gone. But here, I had this new one. And I had to fight for it. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I think we'll probably have more people joining us um, in the next minute or two. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I'm here with uh, Arnett only, I think. Hi, Sebastian. I'm from, Hi, Sebastian. from Hamburg. In South Africa, we're very much behind. 
The doctors really have zero clues. You know, they don't know anything yet. We're, we're kind of both organizing a day of protest as well as organizing individual protests. People obviously are going to find it very hard to get to these protests. I am not, I'm not somebody who's ever done protests before. I have no energy to do one. You can still be out there in, especially if you've got a wheelchair that reclines, but also in a lawn chair. The only way anything is ever going to change is if people can see us. Der ved vi, at der er nogle, nogle psykologiske faktorer med den måde, vi selv tænker på vores sygdom. Det er jo så bestemt, hvordan vi reagerer og hvordan vi, vores adfærd er overfor sygdommen. Og det kan så gøre, at vi får en uhensigtsmæssig adfærd, og dermed kan vi vedligeholde sygdommen. Okay. Jeg må indledningsvis sige, at jeg er fuldstændig uenig med Per Fink. Per Fink hævder... Citat, jo mere de fysisk syge protesterer mod at få en psykiatrisk diagnose, desto mere psykisk syge er de. Kommentar. Altså kan vi tvangsindlægge og tvangsbehandle folk. Men at konvertere fysiske lidelser til psykiske lidelser, som Per Fink gør i, funktions- i forskningsklinikken, er en stor fejl. Jeg vil sige, at grunden til at involvere mig i funktionelle lidelser, det er de voldsomme overgreb, der er sket på en 24-årig kvinde, og hun er blevet tvangsindlagt, tvangsbehageholdt. Tvangs- jeg synes ikke, vi skal gå ind i enkeltsager her. Nej, det, det er ikke retfærdigt. Ikke. Og det, hendes skæbne har gjort, at folk landet over med ME er bange for at lade sig indlægge, fordi de er bange for... Så ja, du fortsætter, de, så jeg vil gerne bede dig om at, at gå ned, og så fortsætter vi med næste taler. Jeg skal, jeg skal bede om ro. Jeg er nødt til at bede om ro, ellers afbryder jeg. Jeg synes ikke, det er en fair behandling, at du giver mig, Karen. Det synes jeg bestemt ikke. Men øh, sådan er det. Det er, det er jo demokratiet i en nødskal. Tak. So proudly, can't you see that I have the strength of a mountain, and I'll take all you throw out. I'm here on behalf of my son Gordon, who is 22. He's doing so well. Um, he's a Of a mountain, 
I've got the courage of the deep blue sea I have the heart of a lion And the stars they burn bright inside of me And although you test me, my God I stand so proudly, can't you see? I have the strength of a mountain And I'll take all you throw at me Every time you do something you love, I know you're going to end up paying for it. Thank you so much. Great, thanks. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But I also know that's what makes you feel alive. Bye. Nice to see you all. Well. I, I just, I know you keep saying like not to think of it like this, but I, I just, I just feel like I'm like robbing you and I'm hurting you and I, I think that's just really hard and... All I can tell you, love, is I am so grateful that you are in my life. You know, if I can talk to you, if I can, like, hold you tight, I'm good. I remember the first time I saw you, you were getting out of your the car and your mom was in the car with you. Yeah. And I thought how cute you were, but wholesome. <laughs> yeah. Randy, come help. I'll just record you sitting over there. When I left, I honestly, honestly thought you would get better. I thought that at this point, if I'm gone, I'm not a crutch for her and she'll have to get better because she'll have to. I felt like if I took care of you guys financially that everything would work out for you guys and y'all would wind up being happier. And I made choices that I regret. And uh, I don't know if there's enough life left in me to make it up to you, but I will try. My Emmy goes up and down. I spend most days in bed. <laughs> Life doesn't just stop because you've got severe Emmy. Family feud, day one. Not that hard, really. So even though I've been stuck in a room or my parameters are so small, I've still lived. Is it recorded? Yep. Ooh. Ready? Oh. <laughs> Before I got sick, every book I read, every movie I saw said, when you fall ill, either you will find the cure or die trying. It always ends in triumph or tragedy. But that's not my story. At least, not yet.
Jennifer, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. All right, can you see it framing? All right, I'm ready. There's the sun. I mean, somehow it's almost as good as, as actually being there. <laughs> this is so beautiful. This is incredible. I, I don't even... You have to be able to hold two things in your head. This illness destroyed my life. But what it showed me, I could never give that back. to be well. I want to wake up tomorrow and be well. And yet, I am grateful for every inch of my life. I am still here. I am still here.